Hello, my name is Tim Black. You're tuned into TBTV. This is a special broadcast because I'm interviewing Dr. Sandy Darity, director of the Samuel Dubois Cook Center on Social Equity at Duke University. He's also a Duke University professor on the subjects of economics, public policy, and African-American studies. You may have ran across his work if you did a search for H.R. 40, ADOS, or American Descendants of Slaves, or the racial wealth gap. But no further ado, here's that interview. Um, doctor, you were explaining uh, reparations or what the need for reparations is. And you named three different pillars of that, and you went on to explain further in detail about those pillars. Could you quickly explain what those three words? Yeah, so the three pillars of reparations that are relevant to uh, Black American descendants of persons who were enslaved in the United States are the following. The first pillar is the, uh, the horrors of slavery in and of itself. The second pillar is nearly a century of legal segregation in the United States, what we refer to as the Jim Crow period, which had an associated wave of white terror campaigns uh, that, that took place during that, that phase in time. And then uh, the third pillar is associated with the period in the nation's history after the passage of the Civil Rights Acts of the 1960s, and uh, and 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 a sustained uh, a sustained period of atrocities that continue to the present moment, which include mass incarceration in the United States, uh, incarceration of such a magnitude that if we look at black males separately, uh, black males have a higher incarceration rate and a higher total number of incarcerees than all of the women who are incarcerated across the entire planet. Um, in addition, uh, we have uh, a, a recent wave of police killings of unarmed blacks, and we also have uh, a sustained pattern of credit and employment discrimination. And then uh, from my perspective as an economist, perhaps the most significant indicator of the inequality that besets American society between blacks and whites, the enormous racial wealth gap. And I'd like to emphasize that uh, if we were to look at the numbers, the share of wealth that is held by black Americans in the United States is approximately 2.6% of the nation's total wealth. Uh, the nation's total wealth runs in the vicinity of 100 to $110 billion. Uh, so blacks have, have less than 3% of that. Uh, on the other hand, we are 13% of the nation's population. And so if blacks were to have a share in the nation's wealth that was consistent or comparable with black share in the nation's population, then we would have 13% of the nation's wealth. And, and for that to occur, it would require uh, the acquisition on the part of black folks in the United States of an additional 10 to $12 trillion in wealth. Um, I wanna emphasize that wealth is distinct from income. I think people frequently confuse the two. Uh, when we're talking about wealth, we're talking about the difference between the value of what you own and the value of what you owe, or the difference between your assets and your liabilities, or another way to think about it is wealth is the net value of your property. Uh, and this is distinct from income because income is a flow of resources that you get. Usually we think about it in terms of a year that's primarily associated with your earnings, whereas uh, wealth is associated with uh, what you own deducting the expenses that you have associated with your debt. Uh, we also call wealth net worth. Uh, and, and, and this is what uh, we have so much less of as a community in comparison with whites, much less of in a relative sense than the differential in income between blacks and whites. Um, and, and wealth is particularly potent and significant or important because it actually provides you with protection from losses in income. So, for example, if a family member who's the primary breadwinner loses their job, or if there's a medical emergency that confronts a family, their capacity to maintain a comfortable or decent standard of living is entirely contingent upon their wealth position. 
And uh, so the less wealth you have, the less economic security you have, the less opportunity to participate in this society because this is a country where the political process is driven by how much money you have and your capacity to fully participate uh, in, in the electoral process to influence electoral outcomes is heavily dependent on whether or not you have resources to do that. And so, uh, you know, if because, we think because about- Because we have being, to pay to play, right? You is have to pay to play in some way. And so uh, if, if we think about uh, uh, the capacity to be a fully engaged individual in American society, to take, to take full advantage of all the opportunities that the society is supposed to provide us with, then we really have to have a situation in which there is equality and wealth uh, across racial lines. So, so during your during your work, Doctor Dirty, you've ascertained that the the way to solve this issue that we have with black folks having so much less than the average white family is to provide a reparations in order. What does that reparations look like according to to your studies? What would what would actually bring us up? Is it just money, or is it a, or is it assets? Is it those stocks and bonds, or is it land? I've heard different. Uh, scenarios, people, uh, different suggestions people have made for what would work. So in premise, if you had additional resources that were monetary, you could purchase land or you could purchase financial assets. Uh, We would have to structure the way in which we uh, distribute the reparations fund so that people actually would have an opportunity to do those sorts of things if that's their desire. I mean, I've always thought that Uh, There's a tremendous amount of passion for self-employment and entrepreneurship in the black community, but we've never had the the wealth foundation to support doing that on an extensive basis. And in communities where uh, blacks had engaged in a successful degree of entrepreneurship, uh, what frequently happened between the end of the Civil War and into the 1940s and 1950s were white massacres that not only destroyed segments of black business communities, but also resulted in whites appropriating much of that property for themselves. And and there's a host of examples of this, but maybe the most dramatic uh, might be Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1921, where the Tulsa black community had a business district that was referred to as a black Wall Street. and, and this, this business district and the entire black Tulsa community in the Greenwood area was essentially leveled to the ground as a consequence of white violence. Right. So, so Dr. Dirt is explaining the, the situation that we, are, that we find ourselves in, and he's saying that reparations is a remedy, can be a remedy, and money. Because I hear people talk about, hey, what if we just give them college? I know uh, Dr. Doctor, uh, doctor, there's a, a, a prominent uh, hip-hop producer who has a big website called uh, DJ Vlad. And recently there's been a conversation about, well, uh, black, since, since the reparations argument doesn't seem to be going over too well with, with white folks, that we could, they could somehow placate black folks by giving them free college tuition. What would your response be to, to that suggestion? Well, I'm, I'm in favor of free college tuition. I'm in favor of free college tuition for everybody, particularly from public universities. I don't know about private universities, but public universities, definitely. Uh, and I, I would try to make some sort of accommodation for historic, historically black colleges and universities, regardless of whether they were public or private, in terms of the, the tuition reduction. So I think I think that's a great idea. I don't think that will eliminate the racial wealth gap, and that's 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 my concern. So I don't view reparations as an alternative or a substitute for other types of universal policies that would benefit all Americans. I view reparations as a complement to those programs, a complement that would be specifically designed to address the racial wealth gap, which I think these other kinds of policies really cannot do successfully. So, um, if, if, and also if you think about it, uh, additional education in and of itself will not eliminate the racial wealth gap. Uh, One of the most disturbing statistics that's emerged from the research that we've been doing is the finding that blacks who have a college degree have two thirds of the net worth of whites who never finished high school. 
And so uh, the depth and severity of the racial wealth gap is so, so deep that we don't have a situation in which the standard ways in which people think blacks should improve their behavior will do much to close the racial wealth gap. Because when black folks do the right thing, the racial wealth gap persists. One of the things I've come to discover, doctor, uh, can I call you Sandy? Yeah, sure. That would be fine. Thank you, Sandy. (laughs) Okay. Um, one of the things I've discovered is most people don't understand the gravity of how bad all black people are in general. Yeah. They see LeBron James. They see, you know, I don't know, any other one of the rappers. One of They see Oprah. They see Tyler Perry. They see, oh, Tyler Perry just opened up his own studio. He's got his own island in Atlanta. And, and black people seem to be doing just fine. And even black people don't understand the gravity to, to which we are behind. And, and, and I myself, uh, uh, Sandy, uh, I don't think I would have started a business had I known Known how underfunded I was and right, how right. unreasonable, un, un, unreasonable so you, I was you, being. You, you had you have the entrepreneurial passion, but like so many people in our community, we don't have the same types of resources to start and to sustain our enterprises. And one of the things that's really critical is, you know, white folks disproportionately can let their new business enterprises fail without it penalizing their lives in the same way in which the average black person would have their life hindered, hampered, or undermined. So it's a riskier proposition for us. And and you would have to argue that in some sense, black entrepreneurs are more, uh, more inclined to take risks than white entrepreneurs because the, uh, the adverse consequences of not being successful are much more severe. Uh, I would also add, I'm not sure why people look at examples of black celebrities as an indicator of the well-being of the whole black community. I mean, I don't think people look at white celebrities as an indicator of the condition or well-being of all whites in America. They don't look at age, prominent Asians as an indicator of the status or condition of all Asians. So I don't know why people tend to do that. But I want to emphasize that the richest or most successful black folks economically still are far, far behind the richest and most successful white folks economically. So if we were to look at the distribution of wealth in the United States overall, Whites own about 90% of the nation's wealth, but constitute about 75% of the nation's population. And that's the reverse of the pattern that we've already described with respect to, to Black Americans. And if you look at the 400 richest people in the United States in terms of wealth, who actually have an extraordinary share of the nation's wealth. I think they, they have about 20% of the nation's wealth. I, I, I may be a little bit wrong on that, but I think that's correct. I don't think any of those 400 people are black. Not even okay. Byron Allen, huh? Yeah, I don't even, uh, no, no, Byron <laughs> Allen's not in that in that category either. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So, wow. Yeah. so, so, you know, just, I just want to reiterate, and this is something I was just talking to my wife about Sandy, and I want the audience to really understand this. Black people don't really know how bad off they have it. They think because they work with a white person uh, 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 and vice versa, white people work with black people and they got similar shoes. Or, hey, the black guy might have a nicer car with better rims. Uh, yeah. He may, dr- he may have better well, tennis we, shoes. We do have better taste. I mean, you know, there's no question. <laughs> that's, a, that's a given. I'm Tim Black, you know, but, but when it breaks down, I don't own my home. Uh, and if I do, I'm refinanced three times. Right. Um, my, my grandmother, she's in a nursing home. My brother's unemployed. My cousin's unemployed. My sister's underemployed. These, this is the reality. And meanwhile, right. that white family who's driving the old uh, Hyundai hatchback, um, they, they got two houses in the family. Grandma has some land down in the Carolinas. Their uncle has a business that's been in the family for three generations. And the list goes on. So people don't tell you their status and you just think it's normal what you have and everyone has what you have, but there's a big, there's a gulf. There's, between a, there's, the two. A, there's a vast gulf. There's a vast gulf. I, and I would add that if we think about business activity or business ownership, it really does give us a, a, a deeper sense of how vast that gulf is. 
if we were to take all of the black businesses collectively, and there's probably about two and a half million black owned businesses in the United States, maybe the figure is a little bit higher. But if we were to take all of those businesses and look at their combined sales revenue, their combined sales revenue would be approximately one third of the sales revenue of Walmart taken alone. Okay. So if people are thinking that the way in which we're going to close the racial wealth gap is by extending or expanding black businesses, given our existing resources, then that's a fantasy. Got it. Got it. That's very sobering. Very sobering. So, uh, Sandy, you got me. I understand black people are behind. Um, how are reparations... But, but I, I want to emphasize, yeah. we're not behind because we do stupid things or we're dysfunctional. Oh, I thought it was because of the, 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 the Air Jordans we like to buy. Uh, That's right, not it. right, right. You know, you know, actually, it's interesting. Uh, you know, people presume that black folks are, are big spenders uh, and bigger spenders than white folks. But, but if you look carefully at the data uh, about household spending patterns and you look at households where there's a similar level of income between black and white households, actually white households spend 1.3 times as much as, as black households, households with comparable levels of income. And the, and the reason they're able to do that is because their wealth position is so much stronger. Uh, and so, uh, so it's not at all the case that black people are, are more prone to spend than white folks. We might buy different things. Right. Uh, but we actually have a very similar savings rate to white folks. And in some income categories, we have a higher savings rate. And that's despite the fact that we have to contend with the issue that you raised earlier, which is if, if we have more of a middle income, um, we, if we have more of a middle income, we probably have more responsibilities or obligations to support relatives who don't have many resources. Uh, Nonetheless, we still save at a rate that's similar to whites out of any given level of income. That's so important to note uh, because there is that there is that negative stereotype that people I don't know where to get it from, but this idea that we just waste our opportunity that yeah. it's the Asian community they they're just so much more frugal uh, yeah. than you and yeah. you need to you need to save more and this is a situation uh, that's brought on yourself. So, like, like I said, I want to I want to kind of move on because. I think unless you're a person who's actually just bigoted, I'm just going to keep it real, Sandy. Unless a person's bigoted, um, they're going to have to come to the conclusion that, okay, black people are not doing as well as white people. And, and, and there is there's uh, historical references and reasons for that, deliberate actions, things that were done via the government um, that created this situation, slavery. Jim Crow, yeah. these are not your average person. I want people to know, we're not talking about an irate white woman in the parking lot of CVS using the N-word. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about generation upon generation being unable to accumulate wealth. That's what yeah. the doctor's talking about. So please, let's let's make sure we're on the right page. So, um, yeah, and I think I think a key thing is what you said: generational. This yes. is a multi generational property pro process of deprivation and denial of wealth. And uh, and uh, if, if you think about it, if you go back to uh, 1865, where there was an unmet promise of 40 acres that were supposed to be delivered to the formerly enslaved folks. And that promise was never fulfilled. I, I think that's the beginning of the racial wealth gap in the United States. Uh, we might not even be having a conversation about reparations had the 40 acre land grants been delivered to the formerly enslaved. And so, uh, so that, that's, that's kind of the cornerstone of this whole process of wealth denial and wealth stripping. Um, if, if, uh, the black, uh, if the formerly enslaved had received the 40 acre land grants, then that would have amounted to at least a total of 40 million acres that should have gone to black Americans. Uh, in the aftermath of the Reconstruction era and in the aftermath of a period in which the promised land grants never were actually uh, delivered, uh, or if they were initially delivered, the, the land was taken away and given back to the former slaveholders, 
in the aftermath of that, up until the early part of the 20th century, Blacks somehow managed to accumulate 15 million acres of land, primarily in the South. That's 25 million acres less than the 40 million figure, but it was a pretty extraordinary accomplishment, particularly given the circumstances and conditions our people were confronted with. And so, <coughs> excuse me. So um, uh, what, what, what is tragic about that process is that progressively that 15 million acres of land was essentially taken from black folks through theft, through seizure, through other forms of appropriation that appeared to be semi-legal, uh, so that the net effect was once you got into the 1970s and 1980s, black folks typically did not own any more than a total of about 1 million acres of land in the United States. Uh, so there's a whole process of loss of wealth that we have to be cognizant of, and it's a loss of wealth that occurred under conditions of violence and force. Um, while we're while we're having that conversation, I want to kind of move things just a little bit into the HR 40 because people are saying that this is going to be a part of the mechanism in which to correct this situation. They said, okay, we need to we need to go through this study first and we can determine if we if we agree that reparations should be done or maybe it can be done or what does that look like? So how does HR 40 play into this idea that okay, black people are finally going to be given some type of equity or some type of equal equal footing with white families? So uh, let me say two things. One, I believe HR 40 or a commission that would be activated by HR 40 is necessary. Uh, but the second thing is I want to say is I don't think that the wording of the legislation that currently is in place is adequate. I think that the the law as it's currently written needs to be rewritten. But uh, but uh, why do I think it's important to actually have such a commission? Uh, I don't think that having such a commission is a deflection from activating a full and comprehensive reparations program. Uh, <laughs> I think it's essential because if we think about the history of other kinds of reparations initiatives, particularly in the United States, uh, they usually were preceded by some form of a commission that did two things, made the historical case for why the reparations program was appropriate for that particular community, and also set up the terms of a program of restitution that could be translated into legislation. Uh, a key example is the reparations program that was inaugurated on behalf of Japanese Americans who were incarcerated during World War II. Uh, that program was preceded by a congressional commission that was called the Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians. And that commission generated a report that set the record straight. And, and the important aspect of what was set straight in the record was the, uh, was the demonstration that American officials knew that the Japanese American community was not a security threat but still proceeded to put them in these various kinds of concentration camps around the country. Uh, the second thing that report did was it provided a plan of restitution. And so I think that in parallel fashion, that's what we should want and expect from a commission that would be activated to address the historical trajectory of racial injustice in the United States. Okay, uh, right there, right there, doctor. Not to interrupt you, but I, yeah. I gotta break. I gotta break this in pieces for people. So, what Doctor Dirty just said there, and please correct me once again if I'm wrong. But the commission. So, our goal with this with this content right here is not to lay out the total case for reparations. The commission, the HR forty, makes a commission that will lay out why reparations make sense. And yep. then how we can be implemented. How so, we can go about how we can implement an actual program. That's what the commission should do. And I think that the legislation has to be written in such a way that it ensures that that is what the commission does. <clears throat> Excuse me. I don't think that the legislation as it's currently written mm -hmm. guarantees that that will be the case. 
so let, let me give just one small example or illustration of what might be problematic with the commission. Uh, the commission that is is designated by the existing form of HR 40. So there are supposed to be 13 commissioners and there's a division in terms of who appoints these commissioners. Three of them are supposed to be appointed by the president of the United States. Now, uh, I don't know of any current or recent president of the United States who I would be confident about appointing commissioners to this particular commission. Okay. So, <laughs> right. so I think, I, yeah. And, and, and I'm, I'm obviously including the previous president of the United States as well. Okay. Right. Who was opposed to reparations. Okay. So, so I think it's, it's really problematic that that's one of the set of appointment of, of one, one, that that's one, person who has authority over appointing some of the commissioners. Another uh, appointee <coughs> is supposed to be made by the president pro tempore of the United States Senate. Now, keep in mind that the president pro tempore is a member of the majority party. Ms. McConnell. And currently it is Chuck Grassley from oh, Iowa. Chuck Grassley, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so now we've, we've lost four slots already, right? <laughs> Uh, and so I think that this is this is a serious problem that we have to rethink the way in which this commission is going to be structured and designed. But my thing, Doctor, and, and your point's well taken, <laughs> Sandy. My thing is, I can't understand how people can be against a commission to take a look at an idea for a thing that we know occurs that has that has hampered Black people to say you don't support HR forty uh, is to say you don't believe that there should even be a look at this. That yep. we should even yep. study it, and, that, and that, our government is, studies all amazing. types of. We study all types of stuff, Doctor. As I'm right. sure you're aware, we study the, the mating of the earthworm. We study, <laughs> you know, we study what happens when a when you bury a, a piece of wood under the ground. I mean, we have these studies that people don't know anything about these pork barrel projects, these projects that go on and on throughout our government for all types yeah. of things. And to think that there are people who are against and 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 you just mentioned that even Barack Obama was against reparations, even the study, a commission to study the idea of reparations. Yeah, no, and, and, and that's, that, is, that is stunning, but I guess it's indicative of the type of society we live in. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, and, and I would say um, that there's another reason to think that a commission of this sort would be of value, particularly if they generated a quality report. Okay. And, and I think around 2000, uh, a survey was done that established that about 4% of white Americans were in favor of black reparations. Okay. 4%. Okay. That means 96%. <laughs> Today, the, the, the best estimates I've seen is about 20% of white Americans are actually in favor of reparations for black Americans. It's not a huge percentage, but it's certainly different from four percent. It's five and times it better. Yeah, it's, yeah. it suggests that the uh, it suggests that the derivative is moving in the right direction. Perhaps uh, I would argue that if you had a high quality report from a congressionally designated commission that included a detailed exposition as to why reparations is the right thing to do that that could increase the amount of support for reparations across the American population. And so that's another reason why I think that the commission is something that is potentially of value uh, and is, is something more than just a delaying tactic. Uh, and in fact, one way you could prevent it from being a delaying tactic is by establishing clear and precise deadlines for the commission to deliver its report. So, you know, I've, I've been thinking maybe it's 18 months from the onset of the commission. So at that point, there should be a report that would also provide Congress with a detailed legislative plan that could be put into place. And so, uh, so, so I see the, the, the possibilities for this commission, if it's done correctly, uh, as being extremely helpful in terms of furthering the uh, the momentum towards a reparations program. Now, listed here, now what, one of the questions I wanted to ask you, doctor, is 
I, guess, I think we got your plan for reparations, or did we actually get that? When you described the three pillars, you described the reasons for it. I, re- described- I described the reasons for it, yeah. So so, um, so, so, my partner, Kirsten Mullen, and I have a book that's forthcoming from the UNC Press called From Here to Equality. And in the final chapter of that book, we sketch a plan for reparations that we've tried to develop over, over the years. Uh, but in addition to that, and perhaps most important from the standpoint of designing a plan, um, I made the special effort to try to organize a committee of scholars that we call uh, <coughs> the Reparations Planning Committee. And um, one of the primary objectives of that committee is to generate a report that would also include uh, a potential scheme of actually exercising a reparations program. Uh, looking at issues like what's the basis for establishing what the amount of the fund should be? How should the fund be distributed? Uh, Who will be eligible to receive the funds? Uh, What's the time frame over which you would try to allocate the funds to achieve goals like, for example, eliminating the racial wealth gap? Uh, what would be the structure of the agencies that would manage the reparations program and so forth. So all of these things are things that are going to be taken up by the committee. Some of these issues are things that we address in our book in the final chapter. (coughs) I can't talk too much about that without getting my publisher upset, but, um, but the, uh, the reparations planning committee has that as a direct assignment also. Uh, and there's some uh, terrific scholars on 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 this committee. Uh, I, I'm I'm a little reluctant to name names because I'm going to forget a host of people. But let me let me mention a couple of people who are on the committee. One is uh, Mary Frances Berry, who is the historian who at one point was the head of the United States' Civil Rights Commission. Mm-hmm. Um, she's the author of a book called. Uh, My Face is Black is True, which is a biography of Callie House, who was a reparations activist at the end of the 19th century. (coughs) Excuse me. A remarkable woman who was actually uh, worked as a washer, clothes washer in Tennessee. Uh, She built a movement of approximately 300,000 black folks to try to get petitions, uh, to petition for uh, pensions for the folks who had formerly been enslaved. Um, uh, they, they brought her down through mail fraud charges, which are similar to the way in which they brought down Marcus Garvey subsequently. It was through mail fraud charges. Uh, but Mary Frances Berry uh, has done this, this excellent biography of Callie House, and Mary Frances Berry has been a longtime advocate of reparations. So uh, she's one of the members of, of, of the committee. Another is a, a political scientist named Thomas Kramer, who actually uh, actually behaves more like an economist. And, and Kramer is the person who has been trying to come up with a set of measures of the cost or damages associated with slavery. And, um, and so he's on the committee as well. I'll also mention a, an economic historian named Trevon Logan, who uh, is thinking very, very carefully about the question of how much the reparations fund should be and what should be the components of the reparations fund. So uh, so we, we are actually trying to work on establishing uh, exact ways in which you might do this uh, because we don't think it's something mystical or mysterious. We think it's something that's concrete, but we have to make sure it is concrete. <laughs> and you know when, when we had this conversation one of the one of the inevitable answers or questions we're going to get and i saw you get this question on c-span but but for the benefit of those who didn't see it that interview uh who are the people who would be eligible based on your criteria uh to receive this reparations if it was to come to pass so um so uh kirsten mullen and i in particular uh developed a couple of a uh, couple of criterion and um and then uh, I think that these criterion were first lay- listed in a paper that I did with Vanilla Frank around 2003 called The Economics of Reparations. Okay. Uh, the first criterion is uh, 
is an individual would have to demonstrate that he or she or they had at least one relative who was enslaved in the United States, one ancestor. That's the first criterion. Now, both criterion have to be met. Okay. So the second criteria is uh, an individual would have to demonstrate that for at least 10 years before the adoption of a reparations program, and or the adoption of a study commission for reparations, whichever came first, Mm -hmm. they had to have self-identified as Black, Negro, or African American. So it's both conditions that would have to be met. That's what would determine or identify the eligible population to receive reparations in the United States. So what you're telling me is Rachel Dolezal, she may get one requirement, but not the other. That's right. That's exactly right. Uh, uh, But then, you know, here's the weird case. Actually, uh, Barack Obama might qualify. He's against it, though, Johnson. He shouldn't be able to participate. He shouldn't be able to get it? Well, (laughs) well, I've always said that the folks who are against it, you know, they can give the money back. They don't have to take it. Yeah, I understand. I wouldn't want them to morally, you know. We're not not forcing anybody to take dollars here. (laughs) (laughs) I wouldn't want to twitch their arm on, on that settlement. Uh, uh, so, so yeah, I but, I... but Barack Obama would qualify, I think, because uh, he he clearly self identifies as black. That's not that's not an issue. But I think on his mother's side, he has enslaved ancestors in the United States. Oh wow! Okay, I know she was Caucasian. <laughs> I I didn't know she had some black blood as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay, so that's that's interesting. Well, there, there are a lot of people who do. So that's why we need this. We need that second criterion about something. Ah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah I'll tell you, man, it's a great when you have <laughs> great folks like you, Dr. Sandy, that uh that know so much more. Cause I would have gave a house away. I, I get a house away. I'm thinking, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, we hear a lot of talk about ADOS. Um, could you <laughs> could you kind of explain what that is? I know that Antonio and Yvette Carnell have done some great work in getting the word out about this. Um, could you explain to folks who haven't heard it or only saw it? In comment sections on YouTube. Yeah, so um, actually it's it's Antonio Moore who first gave me that statistic about uh, more black men being incarcerated in the United States than all women across the globe. Uh, so, uh, so Antonio and Yvette have been extremely active in promoting, developing, and advancing a social movement. And, and it's a social movement that really has evolved out of social media, uh, which is, 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 is a bit unusual, but I think it's going to be something that occurs more frequently as we, as we move forward in time. And, and the premise here is that uh, Black Americans who are descendants of persons who were enslaved in the United States constitute a distinctive ethnic group. And it's a distinctive ethnic group that has a specific claim on the United States government that arises primarily from the failure to provide the formerly enslaved with the 40-acre land grants that they were promised at the end of the Civil War. And it's a claim that's also associated with the cumulative effects of the host of racial atrocities that have been inflicted upon folks who are descendants of individuals who were enslaved in the United States. Um, So that to me is what the gist of Eidos is. It's it's, uh, an assertion of an ethnic identity and a specific political claim that would be similar to the claim that might be made by individuals who are Jamaican who are demanding reparations from the United Kingdom. Uh, So, uh, so I, I, I believe strongly that virtually uh, that black folks virtually anywhere in the diaspora have a claim for reparations, but we don't all have the claim from the same government. And so this is what's specific and unique about the Eidos case. And that's 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 what why I associate myself with it, because I think that those principles Uh, the uniqueness of an ethnic identity and the principle that uh, this is a community that has a a special claim on the United States government 
I think these are both things that are correct. These principles are accurate, and I, 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 I uh, and they inform the way in which I continue to think about reparations. You know, I've heard some some people push back on ADOS and reparations, in the and and one of the one of the reasons or one of the things they say is that uh, it's anti-immigrant, it's anti-black immigrant, and that there are immigrants from different uh, African countries or. Uh, people with dark skin who come to this country and you're dividing us from those people. Uh, what would you say to that assertion, Dr. Sam? So, uh, so I think that we can have solidarity and we also can have particularity at the same time. <laughs> okay. And, and I think that those, uh, the communities of, of more recent immigrants who are black maintain a, a national origin identity and ethnic identity of their own, you know, whether they see themselves as being Nigerian or Ghanaian or Jamaican or Trinidadian, I think that they, they, for the most part, continue to assert that as an important aspect of their identity. And so what I see Eidos is doing, uh, the same thing in terms of the particular American form of black identity, um, and I, I don't see that as as a, as a problem. I, I mean, I think that the the notion that all black people are the same culturally or ethnically is is obviously incorrect. And that doesn't mean that we don't have common cause on many issues, but we also have specific claims that are unique to our particular experience. And so that's that's my response to this. Uh, I also would add. It is only the Eidos community that has been victimized, and I want to use the term victimized, even though some people don't like it, victimized by slavery, by Jim Crow, and the ongoing atrocities. All three of those phases have been imposed upon that particular community. More recent immigrants, for the most part, arrive in the United States after the Civil Rights Acts have been passed. And so, if anything, they've been exposed to the kinds of discriminatory practices and racism that is uh, that is, is is particular to uh, to the post civil rights era. But it's only the Eidos community. <laughs> it's, it's only the Eidos community that's been subjected to uh, all three phases of. Uh, of, of these kinds of uh, indignities and harms. Well, 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 Dr. Dr. Sandy, I realize we, we started late and I realize that, you, you know, you're pressed for time. Uh, uh, folks, we're going to have another, con- this is just a part one. And now that we got the kinks yeah. out, I'm sure we'll be able to schedule a part two. But Dr. Sandy, uh, hopefully you can come back with us and talk more about the economics behind HR 40 and reparations and the black situation and the black agenda. And also your work that you've done on various presidential campaigns. You work closely with a number of politicians, helping them craft their legislation to close the black wealth gap. Uh, so um, I hope that you can do that for us. Yeah, well, but only one of them has actually explicitly said that they're in favor of reparations, and that's uh, Marion Williamson. Uh, and and uh, and the amount that she's talked about is actually way too small. But I'd be glad to talk about all of this uh, in the future. Okay. Well, I look, man. I appreciate it so much, Doctor Sandy. How can people find out more about your work and go to go to look that up? Uh, so uh, if they just put my name in their browser, yeah. uh, I think a lot of my research will pop pop directly up. Uh, also, there are publications that are uh, available on, on the site for my, my research center, the Samuel Du Bois Cook Center on Social Equity. <clears throat> Excuse me. If people go to that website and click on research, They'll, they can scroll down to publications and they can find a large body of the work that is related to the conversation we've had today. Amazing, amazing. Well, Dr. Dr. Sandy, thank you once again for taking time out and I hope to talk to you again, sir. Thank you so much. This is great. That's it, man. Thank you, doctor. All right, well, thank you guys for tuning into their conversation with Dr. Dirty. Hope that you found it to be informative. Don't forget... We're going to have Dr. Dirty back to talk about the true economics of reparations, what that would look like, and who would it impact and who would it not impact. You may be surprised. 
Don't forget to follow Dr. Darity. Just look up Sandy Darity. He's a one of a kind. The only one on the internet. You've been watching TBTV, Tim Black TV, the leading most watched black independent media on the left. Follow me at Real Tim Black and become a member of my Wolfpack. TimBlackTV.com.